Welcome to Dotto Tech. Something a little different today. This week is Waste Reduction Week in Canada. Now, no jokes, please, about reducing my waistline. We're talking waste here, W-A-S-T-E, not waste, W-A-I-S-T. Today, we're going to look at some of the things that you can do to be a little more environmentally responsible, technologically speaking. We're also going to look at some web resources to help you plan that dream vacation. Let's begin by looking at what we can do with some of the garbage that we generate. Computers are fairly environmentally friendly when in operation. But what about disposing of our computers and consumables? That can be another story. Think about the trash that we generate on a regular basis, such as inkjet cartridges. Now, they're small, they fit easily enough in the trash can, so throwing them out is really no big deal, except for one thing. Take a look at them. They are built. How long do you think it's going to take one of these guys to break down? It's going to take a long time. And they won't take them in the recycling bin because there's metal in here as well as residual ink. Well, some high-tech companies are taking on the challenge of reducing the environmental impact from their products. HP, for example, has embarked on a pretty extensive environmental program. They've made it a company-wide commitment to design products for energy efficiency, reduced material usage, and recyclability. Case in point is our little friend here. HP offers a really neat solution. It's called Planet Partners. You can find it if you go to the HP Canada website. Just type in hp.ca slash recycle and you will find their commitment to return and recycling hardware products and printing supplies. If we just follow the link through in the printing supplies, we can read about what they will do as far as taking back inkjet cartridges and then recycling them. Basically what happens is you send a request either by email or call a 1-800 number and then HP is going to send you one of these. This is a postage paid pre-addressed mailer. You just drop your ink cartridges into the mailer and return it. When HP gets the cartridge, they're going to sort it, separate all the parts, and recycle all that they can. You see, these cartridges are designed for single use, so they don't refill them. Instead, the parts are recycled. Actually, i got a little video here. I love little videos. Let's take a look at what they do. You send in all your cartridges to the recycling plant. They take them, and then they sort them. She goes, got it, got it, need it, got it, got it, need it. Sorts them all into their proper colors so they can properly break them apart. And then they put them through a kind of a mashing thing that's going to break them down and, and separate the plastic parts from the metal parts. And in each of those plastic and metal parts are they going to go into a separate recycling program where they're sorted and then they're finally recycled into park benches, automotive parts, tractor parts. Some will even go back into making computer products. Now there's two sizes of containers besides the small mailer which is great for the home or the small office where you just use a small number of inkjet cartridges. These will hold a couple of cartridges each. There's also a box that they'll send you if you're a heavy consumer of inkjet cartridges and there you pop it open they got all the directions there. It's also prepaid postage on this and they also include this nice vinyl liner which is really handy because the inkjet cartridges could leak so you put this in as you're filling it up and uh, over time you're adding cartridges it's not going to leak all over the carpets then you seal it up ship it back back to them and they will then recycle the cartridges in bulk. There's also a similar program for laser cartridges, for your toner cartridges in your laser. But in that case there, inside the box in your paperwork, you're going to find a pre-addressed mailer included. So you just keep your box from your toner cartridge. When it's finished, when it's all consumed, you package it up again, put this on it and send it back to HP and then they will recycle the toner cartridge for you. Works pretty well. So what about hardware now? Well, we all reach a quandary when our computer or monitor reaches the end of its useful life. It feels strange to trash something that just a few years before cost hundreds or, or thousands of dollars. And often it still works, but now we just can't seem to figure out a use for it. Well, if you decided to trash your computer, there's a few options rather than dumping them into a landfill. Let's go back to the HP recycling site, and here we can find they have a hardware link as well. Now, the hardware is a little bit different than the inkjet cartridges. In the hardware, you call HP or contact them, tell them what you want to send back, and they're going to generate a quote because it's going to cost you a little bit of money. The money goes into the shipping because it's more expensive to ship this stuff. You basically cover the shipping, and HP will take care of the rest. They'll make sure that your hardware is disposed of in as environmentally responsible way as is possible. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can conserve and reduce waste. For example, even before you purchase something. I'm a big fan of a multifunction device, printer, scanner, fax machine, the all-in-ones. Besides being great convenience, there's also a lot less parts in a single multifunction than in several standalone devices. So you can conserve before you even purchase. Check out your options before you toss something in the trash to see what other options you have for disposal. It is a worthwhile gesture. 
There is a website celebrating Waste Reduction Week in Canada. WRWCanada.com is a resource encouraging us to reduce waste in all areas, not just technology. Find out what you can do to do your part and reduce the volume of garbage going into landfills across the country. Now let's look at some of the practical things that you should consider before trashing your computer. First up, is there anything useful inside of this computer that I should consider keeping before I send it on to its next incarnation? Now there's no absolutes here, it depends on each individual. If you're a tinkerer who doesn't mind opening up the case of the computer and working on the inside, you're going to keep more parts than the person that just likes to plug it in and never opens their computer. But before you get rid of it, consider a few things. First of all, consider keeping the keyboard and mouse around for backup. Why do you want to keep a keyboard and mouse around? Several reasons. A lot of people drink coffee near their computer, and occasionally coffee spills into the keyboard. The keyboard doesn't work anymore. If you're in the middle of a project, it might not be convenient to rush out to the store and get a new keyboard at that moment. Having a backup is a good idea. Even mundane things like I like to use a wireless keyboard. What happens if the battery dies when I'm in the middle of something or it's late at night and I don't have a backup battery around? Then it's good to have a backup keyboard and mouse that I can plug in, get the rest of my work done. The next day I can get whatever it is, a new keyboard or a new battery, and I'm back in operation. So I always keep an extra keyboard and mouse around the house. Now, as far as when we get inside the computer, there's a lot of things in there that we can consider keeping in certain instances. Things like the video card. Video cards, sometimes they overheat, sometimes they break, sometimes they fry. You might consider keeping a spare video card around. But of course, the video card is you're going to have to make sure you have the same type of bus structure in your new computer as your old computer in order to keep the video card. Similarly for memory, you might want to keep some extra memory around. You might want to put it in the new computer right away if you've got a lot of memory there. So you might consider some of the different cards, keeping them as backups. Power supplies and fans. When a power supply goes, if you have a spare one, you can put it in yourself if you're handy. If you're not, you're going to have to make a trip down to the computer store and get them to put in a new power supply. And of course, having a spare fan around is a good idea because if your fan ever breaks, your computer's lifespan is going to be severely shortened because it's going to overheat. So keeping a spare power supply and fan might be a good idea. Personally, I always keep every cable I've ever had. I don't know why I keep every cable I've ever had, but I've got a big box of cables. So, so often when I gotta plug something new in, if I don't have a cable for it, I go through my box and I find a spare cable. So I've got way more cables than I need. Now, even if you don't wanna keep all of these parts, you can check to see if there's programs that might be interested in taking the parts for you. For example, Computers for Schools. Let's look at their website. Computers for Schools is a national program that recycles older computers back into the school system where they can still have a useful life. And they recycle computers from Pentium 2 and up in newer computers and Power Max and newer computers and they get those back into the school system. Now they prefer you to donate a whole computer, but if your computer's older or broken, they might be interested in the parts. You just contact them and ask them if they want your memory or if they want your video card. But you can do that by looking at their website. Uh, they've got an About Us page here that leads you to all of their different regional sites. All the provinces right across the country have computers for schools offices as well as a national headquarters. They've actually recycled over half a million computers back into the school system. So it's a really valuable service that really benefits all levels of society. Less waste and better for our education system. That's a real win-win. Now let's continue on. What about our hard drive? Say you're donating your computer, maybe you're selling it giving away, or I don't care, even if you're trashing it. There may be personal information on your computer's hard drive that you don't want someone else to recover. So what are your options? Well, option number one is take a screwdriver, unscrew it, stick it on a shelf, and keep it. That way, if you ever want to go back and get information off that hard drive, you can plug it back in. Chances are you're not going to want to do that, but at least you know nobody else is getting their hands on that information. If you don't want to keep it, and you're gonna, the computer's going to continue on in a useful life, say be donated to computers for schools, or you're going to sell it or give it to somebody, then you want to remove the information in another way. You can format the hard drive, which can be a little bit problematic if you're taking a little bit of responsibility for the computer afterwards. If you're giving it to a friend and you formatted the hard drive, you're going to have to reinstall the operating system for them and that, and that can be a little bit of hassle. You can also just go in and erase all the data off of your computer, which is a really great way to go. Let me show you how that works. If you've got Norton System Works installed in your computer, you just open it up and there is a wonderful tool in Norton Utilities called Wipe Info. I love reading the Wipe Info About screen because it tells us here that it will permanently remove files from our hard drive. For additional security, you can use Government Wipe. 
a seven-step procedure to conform to the method specified in the Department of Defense document about this. So seven different ways from Sunday, they're going to wipe all of your personal information off the hard drive so it can never be recovered by anybody. What you do is you actually choose the individual files or folders that you want to wipe the information from so you get all of your personal information, all of your Outlook data, all of your word processing files, all of your personal data, you wipe it off. So somebody's just going to get a computer that still works, has the applications and the operating system still in place, but none of your personal information. Regardless of how you dispose of your computer, make sure that you've removed all of your data from it. You never know where it may end up. So always take extra care, clean all your personal information off just to be on the safe side. For more information about any of the products we cover on the show, drop by our website at dototech.com. We all know that the internet is a superb resource letting you travel the world in search of information. It's also a superb resource helping you travel the world in search of adventure and more. I'm talking about the wealth of travel sites that can really help you in all phases of travel. From researching to planning a trip, booking it, or keeping in touch with friends and family when you're on the road. Let me show you a few of the sites that you can use and we're going to begin with the research sites. Where you go to decide where you want to go. Then we'll look for bargains online. But we're going to start with the research component. And we'll start here at Fromers. Fromers is a well-known travel resource. Now at this site, they have a whole wide variety of resources. But a lot of them are kind of travel book type resources. We go in and let's say we want to travel to North America. Let's plan a trip. I better have a good theme. Ah, my daughter's going to University of New Brunswick. She's going to be graduating soon. I think a family vacation to her graduation and to visit New Brunswick is in order. So. I look here in North America and I find New Brunswick. I don't know a lot about New Brunswick, just been there a few times. Here they've got an overview and this is the sort of thing you'd find in a good guidebook. A nice overview of the things, the history of the province and all the things that you can do. Things you should consider when you're planning a trip, details about getting there, some of the different transportation issues surrounding New Brunswick is all covered and as I say this is very much like a travel book. You go, you read through, you get a really good idea if you're interested in going there. But in a really valuable additional resource here is the community side. Here they have message boards which discuss all phases of travel. You can enter as a guest or you can sign in and if you sign in and you actually log on then you can post questions and you actually get involved in the conversations. And here, if we go into Canada, let's find Atlantic Canada, there it is, the Atlantic provinces. There's 56 current discussions going on and we find discussions about music, about visiting Nova Scotia in October, caravan tours. Now this is people who have visited and are posting information about what their experiences were like or are thinking about visiting and asking questions where other people who have already been are then responding. So you're getting first-hand knowledge of people who are traveling to that region. Very, very valuable information. Now if you're in the research phase and you're trying to decide where you may want to travel, this one is an excellent resource. Let's continue on. There is other forum type sites such as the Lonely Planet Online. Now I found that this one was kind of more geared towards the adventure traveler. It had kind of a little more exotic information or exotic sites. And here at the Lonely Planet's uh, travel forum called the Thorn Tree, we find geographically related chat forums. So if we were interested in traveling, say, to Thailand, we can go in there and they've got some additional real value here. First of all, there are moderators which are probably experts on the region who are going to be adding a lot of valuable content to people's comments and posts. But they also have an FAQ thread. That FAQ thread is going to be the important things people need to know if they're traveling to that region. And it's not just important things from a guidebook, but important things from people who were there and people who are there very recently. So you've got very current information as well. So if you're concerned about visiting a region or you've heard rumors about a region, you can say, I heard that this is something I should be concerned about. And somebody who's maybe there right now or was just there weeks ago is going to say, no, that wasn't the case at all. Or yes, that is something you should be aware of. And here's what I did to mitigate that challenge that we faced. So really valuable content in these discussion forums. Now, hopefully, after a little or a lot of research, all of your questions have been answered. And now you're ready to start actually planning your trip. Now we need to book our hotels, our cars, our flights. Now this can actually be the most frustrating part of the whole process as there are thousands of booking sites that all seem to tie into the same databases and the average person doesn't really ever know if they're getting a good deal or not. They hear about these fantastic deals. Am I looking in the right places? Let's start and show you how I go about booking my travel and hopefully that'll get you in the right direction. Let's start with flights. 
most people are usually going to start booking their flights with one of the big amalgamators like Expedia or Travelocity. Let's go to Expedia and let's continue our idea of booking a trip to New Brunswick. So I'm going to choose flight only in the Expedia site from Vancouver to Moncton. New Brunswick and the date we're going to leave is October the 2nd. Let's leave October 2nd and let's return. Let's give ourselves a good week or so there. Let's return on October the 11th. Yeah, that'll give us a little bit over a week. There we go. Now we search for the flight and now it's going to go and it's going to search the airlines databases and bring me back the best priced flights. Now typically speaking for me, I've always found that the prices that I get here are pretty close to as cheap as I can usually get, although occasionally and it's worth checking the airlines own sites because sometimes you will get better prices there. So this is just kind of the first step. You go through and you see it's going to be about $700 on Air Canada and we continue on. Now I typically won't book my flights here. They only give me Air Canada flights. Huh. I typically don't book my flights here. I use it to, to find uh, the, the schedules and find what airlines are going there. But for my flights, I'm usually only on one of two different airlines. So first up, I don't really have to search very far. And let me show you the main reason now that I use airlines own sites to book flights. Let's go to one of my favorite airlines, WestJet, and let's book this look at the same trip from Vancouver to Moncton on October the 2nd, returning October the 11th, and let's check our fares. Holy cow. Well, there's a big price difference. It was about $700 in Expedia. Look here, we can get $199 one way and we can actually get a return fare for $199 the other way. So visiting WestJet's own website, we've already been able to save substantial dollars. But there's another benefit to visiting here is let's say that the travel was more expensive here, but you had some flexibility in your dates. Just by clicking previous day or next day, you can check the rates and find if you can get a much cheaper flight the next day. See here, the flights are already more expensive the next day. So having some flexibility in your travel uh, gives you the option to be able to get better rates as well. And it's easier to browse that information on the supplier's own website. Hey, and there's another bonus here, and that is they, you save six bucks when you book online, and six bucks is six bucks. Now, once you've decided on your flights, then you need to book your necessities, such as where you're gonna stay. Now, this is a superb site for helping you to decide on hotels. It's called TripAdvisor, and TripAdvisor is unbiased reviews of hotels, resorts, and vacations. This is you and I posting reviews of hotels, not paid travel writers who are comped into the hotel and taken care of to write a review of the hotel. No, this is you and I who've gone and laid down our credit card, paid for the service, and then is gonna tell the world whether it was good or not. Let's put in Moncton, because we're heading for Moncton. And let's search and see what Moncton hotels people have stayed at. And we have six results for hotels in Moncton, including the Chateau Moncton. I've heard good things about that. Let's take a look. And there we find reviews that two people have given us on the Chateau Moncton. Now here they both say that it's a really nice hotel. When I was doing my research, I found hotels that didn't get such flowing reviews. Some people said, you know, the hotel was dirty. We didn't get the sort of service we expected. We paid way too much for what we did get. So you're going to get honest reviews from people just like you and I, people who take their credit card, pay for the hotel, are not comped there because they're a travel writer, but have actually paid for the service and then are giving you the benefit of their experience. Very valuable. Scroll through the rest of this site for lots of more information. And down at the bottom, this is another thing I like, they put together the other hotels in the area. So if we go to Sackville, which we'd end up going to because that's where the university is. There's a review of three Sackville hotels, so we can choose which one we want to stay at when we go for Stephanie's grad. Here's one other benefit we find on most of these sites, and that's the ability to be able to book directly from the website with the hotel. Now, I don't like to book my hotels through these amalgamators. I will use these sites to find the best price I can get, but then I will contact the hotel and make my own deal with the hotel. Sometimes I can negotiate a better price, but at the end of the day, I don't want there to be a middleman between me and the hotel. I want to contact them, give them my credit card, and have a relationship directly with them. So we've got our hotel, we've got our flight, finally it's time to get our car. And this is where the big amalgamators really shine. I have no loyalty in the car rental market. Price is everything to me. So let's go to Travelocity and let's look at booking a car. And here, typically speaking, I find the best prices that I can get on the amalgamators website. We'll choose our dates of October the 2nd to October the 11th. And we will search, I don't care what car it is, I just want it to be cheap. And here are the results. 
Now, what I like about this is I see all the different classes of automobile, from economy up to the minivans, uh, done across the screen, so I can see how much it costs me to take each step up in larger automobiles, and then all of the different suppliers are listed vertically down the side so I can quickly decide which car I want to rent and get the best deal. Now I'm not positive that if you sign up for one car company's loyalty program and stay with them and keep renting off them and uh, if you'll get a better rate because I've never spent that long with any single car company but I think I do pretty well just renting from the cheapest one that's offering me the cheapest rate when I'm traveling to town on that particular day. Now we've only had time to scratch the surface for travel related sites. The forums alone are such a marvelous resource. You really owe it to yourself to check them out and participate in them. There are literally thousands of other sites. Some are excellent for cruising, including quite a few with last minute travel bargains. Most of those will also allow you to sign up to get a newsletter that will tell you when there's last minute travel bargains available. That's if you've got a lot of flexibility in your travel schedule. There's no point in showing you all those right now because those bargains will be gone by the time you see this. But the good news is, if you search for yourself, there are always new bargains popping up. When you're traveling, you can keep a photo record of your trip on the web. There's a lot of free online public photo albums that you can use to upload your photos while you're on the road for safekeeping or to show family and friends what a great time you're having while they are stuck at home. Thanks for joining us today. We can all participate in Waste Reduction Week in Canada. It doesn't take too much effort to find a lot of areas where we can improve. Oh, before we go, I want to show you one other web resource. When I was researching computer disposal, I came across a pretty neat site. This one is put out by the City of Vancouver, actually by the Engineering Services Solid Waste Division of the City of Vancouver. It is a list of alternate disposal and recycling locations. So this tells us other th places that we can take things other than a landfill, and they give you a lot of good information. The address, they also include, like here for batteries, if the place is going to charge you for taking the battery back from you and how much they charge. So you can find uh, all the information you need to dispose of anything, including computer equipment. Take a look here. Some places will even pick up your computer stuff if you give them a call. So that's a really good resource for not just computer equipment and batteries, all sorts of things all the way through down to look. What do you do with a propane tank? Oh, there it is, propane tanks. Here are the places that'll take propane tanks. If you aren't in the Vancouver area, you can just do a search to see if you can find similar information in your area. Well, thanks for joining us. We will see you next time in hopefully a cleaner and more environmentally friendly place.